Very many thanks, Bert. Thank you. Thank you to the Wall family. Um, it's my uh, pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker today. Uh, in April of this year, uh, Dan Price, CEO and founder of Gravity Payments, entered into the compensation purpose of business debate with great gusto, with a bold move. He, through a combination of a personal pay cut and profitability and gravity payments part, decided to create a minimum wage in his company of $70,000. This story went viral immediately, and it's been amazing. It has given Dan, uh, since then, a platform from which to discuss the purpose and practice of business, certainly in ways that our school here at SBGE can get alongside and, in fact, applaud and endorse. He has emphasized a business world where the purpose of business is beyond the bottom line, where customers are keyed in on and focused in on and upheld and served, and where employee well-being is honored. This is all in the context of a thriving business that is a credit card uh, payment company that looks at super ways of, super efficient ways of uh, processing credit cards. And, you know, maybe in a few years you might also go to him for your, your first business loan if you're a developing entrepreneur here today, an emerging entrepreneur. Um, Dan graduated from SBU in 2008 and he has won many awards for his um, entrepreneurial abilities, which we're very proud of as a school. And uh, there are several Gravity Payment employees here today. And so I think they're all over at the table around here somewhere. And they have a green stroke on their uh, name tags. And so students at the end of today, if you'd like to really find out what it's like to work at Gravity Payments, come and talk to some of Dan's employees. Dan, it's a, we are just privileged to have you today and we want to give you a warm welcome and thanks very much for coming today and talking to us. Okay, I'm going to try to go super fast because I love the Q&A and they only gave us 10 minutes for Q&A. I feel like I could do Q&A for like an hour. So I'm going to try to go as fast as possible. But before I start, I'm curious, how many people here would say that you grew up in a, like a conservative Christian or evangelical family? It's a pretty good number. That's actually a higher percentage than most of the talks I do, believe it or not. <laughs> so we're going to get along because I would have raised my hand, absolutely. Curious, any homeschoolers in the room? Which is also, I think it's probably 30, right? 10%? That's actually a pretty big percentage compared to what I'm used to in most talks that I give. So I was a homeschooler, and how many of you know the stereotype of homeschoolers? <laughs> okay, so you understand me. I fit the stereotype. I went to school for the first time in seventh grade, which is a tough time to go to school. I didn't know that. I thought that all the kids would love me. And I remember going to school, and I was wearing tennis shoes, and somebody was making fun of me for my tennis shoes. And I started to look and all the other kids had these skate shoes on. And they had a distinct look to them. You know, they were a little wide and they were like furry compared to my shoes. So I saved up some money over the next few weeks and I went to Payless and I bought some shoes and they had two for one shoes. So I could get my athletic shoes and I could get my cool shoes that I could wear. Bring these shoes for gym. These shoes, I'm gonna be cool. People are gonna like me. Anyway, I show up one day with my new awesome skater shoes. And one of the kids looks at my shoes, he's like, dude, what are you, I mean, I'm, he's trying to help me. Why are you wearing those shoes to school? What are you trying to do? And I was like, what are you talking about? They look exactly the same as your shoes. He's like, yeah, but mine say Vans on the side. <laughs> and yours say Payless. <laughs> so it was a hard time, but I hit the lottery. I'm trying to go super fast. I started a rock band with two of my friends, and in spite of the fact I didn't have all the social skills, they were really good musicians, and I was okay, and we ended up just hitting out of the park and having all these crazy events happen to us quickly. So our seventh grade year, we played a show for 300 people. 
Uh, five members of our favorite local rock band showed up, asked us to go on tour with them. We started touring between seventh and eighth grade. Um, we couldn't drive, so we paid for gas and they drove us. Um, eventually, we were played on Christian radio stations all over the US, in every market. And in fact, even like a few years ago, I got a call from a friend in Hawaii. The Christian radio station in Hawaii just played one of your songs like 10, 15 years later. And we actually played a show, it was called Light in the Night in Boise, Idaho. And we had been on tour and we'd kind of blown up on the local radio stations. We came back and there were 5,000 people there and a thousand of them were in the front singing a song to me that I had written when I was 12 years old going through that hard time. And it was so incredible. And we did what all successful rock bands did. We broke up. <laughs> it was horrible. And like the two guys in the band, they're really good musicians and really cool, so it was fine for them. And I was like a loser and not that good. So I was like, man, this sucks. My life's going to be horrible now. And I, I was just, I wanted to do something and I didn't know what. And my dad was kind of like an entrepreneur inside a big company or a medium-sized company. And he'd always kind of, to me, he had always instilled in me that creative people who are going out and starting businesses and taking risks are people that are really important to our economy, important to our family, important the way we think about them. And when I got to interact with these independent business owners in the band, they were the ones that I connected with that I cared about the most. I asked myself why. And I, I didn't know why because when I was working with them, I just felt good. And it was like hard to describe. And so I thought, well, maybe I can work with these independent business owners. And one of them was a coffee shop owner. We play, you remember MTV Unplugged where they play the acoustic shows? We would do acoustic shows. We got the idea from MTV Unplugged at this coffee shop. And the coffee shop owner uh, was complaining about her credit card processing. So while I was in high school, I decided to help her with her credit card processing and her gift cards and her point of sale system. And then she introduced me to her friends I built a small practice of people that I was helping. And basically, you know how like Comcast like raises your rates every like six months and you call up and yell at them and they lower it? I was basically doing that for her. I'd call up her credit card processor and yell at them. And I thought, man, my life's gonna be horrible if I keep doing this. There's gotta be a better way. <laughs> and so uh, my freshman year here at SPU, uh, in January, February of my freshman year, right after one quarter, I officially launched Gravity Payments. I decided for like three days to drop out of SPU. Um, and people that went to SPU and my professors and everybody was like trying to convince me like you love school, your grades are good, like you, could try, you should try to see if you can do both. So I stayed at SPU and actually re-enrolled but there was a little bit of, I'm gonna get in trouble with this table in a sec. There was a little bit of a conflict because I was closing a business deal and my Roommate loved to play shoot 'em up video games at like full volume. He had an amazing speaker system. And so I went into my closet and I started wrapping clothes around my head with my cell phone. And I was talking to the chief financial officer of University Volkswagen Audi, which was a big client of mine that I ended up getting, and trying to explain why there was a war zone going on. <laughs> I didn't tell anyone my age. I didn't tell anyone I went to school. I didn't tell people at school about what I was doing for the most part. And so I decided I need to move off campus. Well, there was a little loophole I found. When I unenrolled the process of moving off campus, because I had been denied the right to move off campus, but when I unenrolled and then moved off campus and then re-enrolled, they forgot to check <laughs> if I was living on campus. Anyway, I'm gonna fast forward a bunch. <laughs> So 2008 hits, I'm making $30,000 a year thinking this is the most amazing thing. I'm graduating from SPU, I can make enough to like live a normal life, I'm happy, I can serve these business owners that I care about, everything's perfect. And we lost, we were making almost no profit, we lost 20% of our revenue the fourth week of August of 2008. I just graduated and we were ready to lose everything in seven months. So we brought everyone together 
and we overcame it and I was so excited because we grew our revenue, we kept our expenses the same, and we got past it, and then one of our vendors went bankrupt, and we got implicated. We almost lost everything. We did the same exercise, and then one of our biggest clients went bankrupt, and we're on the hook again for $350,000 that we didn't have. We got through it. All that, I'm skipping all that story just to say, I got really scared and tight after the recession. I was scared to, to do anything because this dream I had of serving independent business owners, I was about to lose that dream because I wasn't careful enough financially in my mind and I wasn't ready for the recession. So I got super careful and 2011 hit three years later and what happened? Our profitability was way up. We were making a bunch of money. We were growing fast because I was working so hard. I was so motivated, but I was building a business that I didn't realize was actually unethical and immoral in so many ways. We were serving our clients. They were first and foremost, but we were exploiting the people that work there. And I had no idea. Do you ever get the feeling like somebody hates you or they're really mad and you're not sure why? <laughs> I had that feeling about a gentleman who's really shy and so I actually did what I would always do, corner him in the parking lot. <laughs> and I said, why are you mad at me? And he said, you're ripping me off. You're not paying me enough. What was my response? We pay based on market rates. HR determines what those market rates are. I don't. You have a range and your manager decides where you fit in that range, I don't. What do I have to do with how much you get paid? It has nothing to do with me or any decisions I make. We're following the market, we're doing things the way every other company does it, and we have to do it this way. Turns out people said all this to me a little bit later in the story, which you guys pick up on. But for three days, all my friends, all my colleagues at Gravity that I talked about, it, just a few, all said, it's his fault, it's not your fault, it's his responsibility to find a job that pays him what he wants to make, it's not your responsibility, <clears throat> and he should stop being a victim. And after hearing that 20 or 25 times and realizing that I was still asking for a 26th person to validate me, I realized maybe I was wrong and he was right. And three days later, it just hit me like I've been doing business the wrong way. I haven't been thinking about the way other people are affected by my decisions. So we did something that we'd never done before in 2011. We did a $1 across the board pay increase, which was all we could afford at the time. But we decided to set a goal for one year and one year only. We're going to raise the, the we're going to try to have a goal to have 15% salary average increases. We actually ended up hitting in 2012, that next year, 20%. And the intention was for the profit to go down and we we're going to, I'm gonna use a dirty word, redistribute the success of our business in a more fair way, right? And it didn't work because yeah, we hit 20% increases in pay, but our profit went up by even more. Well, I grew up in a conservative Christian family, so I understand what punishment feels like. This was not punishment, and clearly I need to be punished. So I said, we're gonna do it for the second time, but we're never gonna do it again. If we ever did this for three or four years, we'd be completely out of business, no chance we could survive. We again average 20% raises, and again, the profitability of the business goes up. Well, at this point, I've gotten over the idea of being punished, and I'm just excited about what's happening. So we do it again and we repeat the same experiment in 2014, we get the same results. So 2015 rolls around and just like in 2011 when I overcame the recession, I'm incredibly proud. I think I must be the best thing in the world. I must be the best entrepreneur in the world. I'm awesome. This is incredible. But I know deep down there's still something that's wrong and I can't put my finger on what it is. I saw a 60 minute story on income inequality and I cried the whole way through and I don't know why. And there's something that's wrong but I can't figure it out. And I have a huge, huge military crush. Any ROTC folks in here? Got one, any students? We still have ROTC here, right? Okay, good. Uh, 
I think the ROTC folks are engineers because they like working hard. No, just kidding. Sorry. <laughs> I'm on a hike with a woman that I think is spectacular. She served in the military. She was enlisted for 11 years. She was promoted to staff sergeant, which is a very high position in enlisted ranks. And we were on a hike in the, in the Denny Creek area. And she was explaining to me how a $200 rent increase was causing her to have to reevaluate her whole life. Well, I knew her finances because we were close friends and I had helped her out in the past and had conversations. And I knew she made more than a lot of the people that worked at Gravity. And some of these people at Gravity had done wild things that had been super helpful to me personally and professionally. And yet I knew that their means were lower than hers and she couldn't live a normal life. I'm making $1.1 million a year at the time, so a $200 rent increase, I can't even fathom how that could be disruptive. Like, it could be annoying, but not disruptive. And I had read this study, Angus Deaton and Daniel Kahneman, $75,000 a year, Princeton 2010. Dollars up to that have a huge impact on your well-being. Dollars over that have a lesser effect on your well-being. And it clicked, and I asked her the question, how much money would you need to make to just live a normal life and not be stressed out all the time? And it was the same number, more or less. And I just decided right then and there that I didn't know when, I didn't know how, but I was going to find a way, if I really said that I valued the people that I was working with, I was gonna find a way, I didn't have to help them or create financial success, success for them, but I was no longer going to be a part or an author of a system that designed a lack of well-being. Such an inequality that it created, it harmed their well-being proactively. I was no longer gonna be a part of that system. And I didn't know how fast I could do it, how I could do it, but I just determined I'm going to find a way. And I, I didn't sleep through the night a single time between that day and when I made the announcement several weeks later in April. Um, mostly I would wake up with nightmares, forget this horrible idea. <laughs> Your life is so good right now and you're about to make it terrible. And I had no idea like what all would happen and you know, I, I think I've gotten a lot busier and all those types of things for reasons that I would have never anticipated. But the point that I am trying to make is it's easy to be scared when you're convicted and you know you need to make a change. So I really wanna wrap up because I wanna get to Q&A, but I'll leave, I'll leave you with just one last thought. I think what helped me stay focused in my life so far is I have a retirement goal and it's not time bound. My, my general time for it is 40 years. I'd like to retire 40 years, 35 years from now because I said it five, six years ago. But I'm not going to retire until this happens and as soon as it happens, I'm going to retire the next day, even if it happens tomorrow. I want to be a part of a shift, a revolution, whatever you want to call it, where business is about purpose, service, mission. And we all have an orthodoxy that money is a means to an end. It's supposed to serve your life, what you actually care about deep down. And I go around, talk to, you know, I, I speak at, I'm speaking at Brown University on Thursday. Right? I go to some of the top schools and it's so foreign. There's a, there's a feeling that unless your top priority is money, you must be dumb or stupid or messed up. And I just don't think that's right. So as soon as that shift has happened, and the way I want to do it is just by making gravity payments succeed as a service organization, where we actually suck up all the oxygen in the room, this will, the capitalists will like this, and actually competitively beat and make it a competitive necessity to think this way, to act this way. Once I've done that, I'm done. And 
I'm willing to give up everything else professionally to do that one thing. And I'm not going to compromise on any of my actions or anything I do if it doesn't fall in line with that goal. So what I'd like everybody in this room to do at some point is to sit down and say, what's my one thing that I'm willing to give up everything else for? And how do I connect that to my studies here at SBU? And how do I connect it to my career? And how can that be a guiding light so I will never compromise? I'll never do something just because somebody else did it that way before or just because somebody else said that's the only way to do it. That's the way you have to do it. And I don't care if that's my boss, my CEO, my boss's boss. If somebody tells you to do something that compromises your one thing that you care about, you have to find a way to convince them and help them see how that's not the best way to go for their organization. So I would, it would, it would, Pay me back a thousand times over for the time coming here today, and I appreciate the opportunity. If, if you all would spend a half hour, an hour on a Sunday thinking about your one thing, and then practice connecting it to what you do every day. So let's do questions. <laughs> Hey, Dr. Wong. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. That was wonderful. Thanks Thank so much for coming back, spending your valuable time with us. Thank you. Sharing your story and modeling and living into the tensions of some of the values that we really try to teach our students here at SPU. Thank so you. we do have about 15 or 20 minutes for questions, and I've been asked to facilitate this as well as to ask the first question. So while I'm asking my question, uh, if you want to stand or raise your hand, I'll call on you. And I would like to ask Dan to repeat the questions into the mic sure. for the sake of the media and so that everybody can hear the question. So Sounds my great. first question is this. Obviously, this uh, decision has gotten you a lot of great media. I see you all over the place, which is wonderful. But there are naysayers, and among them, management professors who develop theories and do research and who believe uh, that human nature is eventually going to take over and that formerly higher paid employees whose salaries no longer reflect differences in performances or in performance or responsibilities will lose motivation or even quit. Um, what in your experience from your time at running Gravity uh, do you have that maybe a more positive aspect of human nature will emerge and that employees might respond differently? And if they don't, how are you going to address that issue? How many people grew up listening to Rush Limbaugh? Come on, raise your hand proudly. <laughs> I grew up listening to Rush Limbaugh. Um, I'll prove it. When I was a kid, he had this song about Donna Shalala, who was in the Clinton administration. It went, Shalala, got me on my knees. I could keep going. He also had one, it was in the voice of Bill Clinton, but said, I think, to a Beatles tune. Um, All your money I will tax from you. <laughs> so I grew up listening to Rush Limbaugh, and of course, he's very funny. I mean, if you saw that on The Daily Show or something, like, it would be cool, but because Rush Limbaugh does it, it's not cool, right? <laughs> like, he's pretty funny. So I grew up being a Rush Limbaugh fan, and it was very surreal to have Rush Limbaugh first talk about me, say that not only am I a socialist, not only am I a failure, but he hopes that I fail so that I can be the case study for all business schools of how to ruin a good business. When you start thinking about ethics and morals and integrity, like you're not going to have a successful business anymore. And he went into detail about how human nature was going to take over and people would be happy for a little bit, then there would be entitlement, revolt, People that didn't benefit as much as others would feel jealous and the entire company would implode. You know what I did when I heard that? I actually forwarded it to people that work at Gravity and said, he's right. We need to make sure this doesn't happen because Rush Limbaugh was 100% right about human nature and I think that his analysis was spot on. Just going to say it. My idea of human nature, of course, is the exact opposite of Rush. That when you put yourself out there and take a leap of faith, like we did with the goal of 15% raises, 
or like we did when we could have actually multiplied our profits by 10 because we negotiated a big discount for all of our clients, but there was nothing contractually that made, it, made us pass it on to our clients. We actually contractually could have just kept it and our profit at the time would have gone from 500,000 per year to 5 million a year. And everybody in my industry said, that's the stupidest decision you could ever make to just pass it on and you won't even get any credit for it. When you take these leaps of faith, sometimes you fall. It's true. But most of the time, there's a cool airplane, like in the movies, that shows up, or, or a bird, and picks you up and takes you to the next ledge. <laughs> and it's so amazing. And so Rush is right about human nature. I'm right about human nature. I think that my idea of human nature is where we're going. And I think Rush's idea of human nature is where we're coming from. And I think that's going to be a difficult, messy transition for us to navigate. And I think SPU business students and SPU business grads can be at the for forefront of that transition. So questions from the audience? Awesome. Yeah, well, a great amount of your success in recent months can probably be attributed to a lot of the media coverage that you've been receiving, um, as this is a really revolutionary idea. Do you think you still would have been successful if it weren't for that media coverage, or if another company were to follow suit and not receive that, do you think they could still succeed as that? Austin, thanks for your question. So the question is, how much of the success is attributable to um, media presence or kind of presence in people's consciousness? Is that Yep. Um, I'm not sure exactly what success you're referring to. We're still pretty early to declare any kind of success. And, and if, if I somehow implied that my program has been successful to date, let me retract that. <laughs> uh, because in the business world, in the media world, and in like movies and TV shows, yes, you get a nice story arc in two hours. Doesn't usually work that way in the business world, unfortunately. So we are seven months and four days in or something like that. We're like in like the, the first quarter of the first quarter of the football game right now. And I think that media attention would be great if we were a consumer business. I mean, if we were selling like t-shirts and water bottles, like, like all the media attention we've gotten would have been like off the charts, like tremendous for us. We're in an enterprise business. Uh, we, we serve also small and medium sized businesses as well. These are people that don't watch TV, don't read the newspaper. They have so much going on. They're doing blood, sweat, and tears building their business. And also, the media attention creates a lot of distraction. So while it, it is helpful, it, it might not be as helpful as, as, you, as you might think. The other thing to consider is we lose money on every new client that we bring on for the first 10 to 15 months because we don't charge them anything when they become a client and we spend a few thousand dollars bringing them on and it takes us 15 months to get that money back. So having a good brand is a good thing, but in our business, it's got to be an accurate brand that attracts the right client and the delivery has to be better. So I think we we are a, a nice, as good of a controlled environment as you can be because we're somewhat insulated in our company from the media. Our clients are insulated. And to the extent we get clients because of the media, unless we up our game and can deliver and keep those clients for 10, 15, 20 years, which is our historical average, you know, our, our attrition rate's around 5%, which implies like a 20 year lifetime for each customer. Unless we can do that, we'll literally lose money for every new client that the media attracts to us. So I think that we are huge underdogs to make this work from, an eco from a purely economic standpoint. I did it because it was the right thing to do. And there's an implication that if you do things because it's the right thing to do, that you are somehow socialist or heretic or something else. And I grew up in Idaho, and I didn't know what the term venture capital meant. I didn't know what capitalist meant. I didn't know what entrepreneur meant. I didn't know what socialist meant. People do stuff like this in Idaho. They just do things because it's the right thing to do. <laughs> and so my motivation to make it an economic success 
came after the decision was made. And it's like, well, as long as we're going to do it, and now I've almost been put in this position where sometimes I'm asked to be a spokesperson for this type of thinking. And so I actually want to create an economic success because I want to encourage other companies to do it and provide a roadmap. But that wasn't the initial goal. That wasn't the initial idea. That was something that came after. And if we don't, if we never recover our profits, I'll still be 100% proud and excited about the decisions we've made as a company. If we recover our profits, I think people will really freak out because now we can have our cake and eat it too. And if for some reason this creates some like crazy hockey stick for us as a company, I do think we're insulated enough that it'll really set the world on fire because I think what it'll show is all of our basic assumptions about life, human nature, and business can be wrong if we make them wrong. And I think that's going to be a dangerous and powerful. My favorite headline in all the media coverage was, it said, the threat <laughs> of gravity payments. So thanks for the question, Austin. I think we have time for maybe one, maybe two, two more questions. Um, really? Yeah. Did you take the people who are already above 70,000 and send them also? So we have a really nice track record for helping people reach financial goals that work at Gravity. We don't do it 100% of the time, not anywhere close to that, but there are a lot of situations where people meet much loftier financial goals than anything close to $70,000. My message, I think, to those folks was this, my solution, my idea is unfair to you. And I could try to solve that problem financially, but it's going to be hard to make it work. And it starts to create, I think, systemic problems if you do it all the way up, up the chain. So my theory was, let's double, triple, quadruple our investment in education inside the company and double down on the strategy of helping you to set goals that you can achieve that are as high as you want to get. Um, the first person I hired at Gravity, I could only afford to pay him 24000 a year with no health benefits. That's why I will never criticize a business owner for what they pay because no matter how bad it is, I've been worse, way worse. But today he makes, you know, in the, in the very strong six figures, not close to 100000 but much more than that. And I'm proud of that and I want to be, you know, I want to play my small part in helping people achieve those those types of goals. Uh, but as a business owner, the number one thing I can do for people is spend time with them and mentor them. And money, it's not about the money. So this wasn't about paying people more. This was about not having people that were doing blood, sweat, and tears to make me money living in poverty. So it was about basic needs. It wasn't about paying more money. And I think between paying more money and investing in mentorship, education, giving people a platform to rise on their own. I definitely choose the latter in that case. One more? One more. All right. Up in the back there. I know you've probably received a lot of resumes as of lately. <laughs> <laughs> what qualities do you look for in your employees? Oh, oh. Great question. So what do I look for in somebody that's going to work at Gravity? Um, I want somebody who will be, who will follow what they think is right 100% of the time, especially if they think it conflicts with what I think is right. And I want somebody that will be honest, especially if it's dangerous. Those are the most important things. And actually from Professor Rand, who's here in the audience, I learned uh, uh, think, act, and learn, right, as being essential for operations management. And we actually adapted his model, and we said every single person that works at Gravity is the CEO. What does that mean? They're an important decision maker. They can't do something because somebody else did it before that way. They can't do something because somebody told them. 
And we adapted his phrase and said, we're gonna think, act, and learn like a business owner, every single person that works here. And so everybody's the CEO, and so it's a tough adjustment, but when you, when you come to work at Gravity, if I say, why did you do that? And you say, well, that, I thought that's what you wanted. That's, that's like a really, I'm gonna have a bad day that day. You just made me have a bad day. Um, so it's, I mean, it's, it's entrepreneurial skills, right? And in my background, you know, where I had faith that was really important to me, I'm, I was growing up, I was studying the Bible, you know, two hours a day. I was very disciplined. And that's really helpful in the business world. Sometimes you also need to compensate for some of that discipline by increasing your kind of independent street creativity. And so we look for a really special, hard to find combination of those two things that's anchored in you coming to me and saying, Dan, I wanna be the CEO. That's what we like. Thank you so much. Really nice to be with you and love to say hi. And <laughs>